is Occupy Freedom. I'm David Laurie Vanderbeek. I'm the next governor of ne Nevada, and today we're going to be talking about 9 11, the 9 11 terrorist attacks. Uh, we have in studio Richard Gage, AIA. He's the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9 11 Truth. So I want you to get all your family members, I want to get all the 9 11 truth doubters to watch this, sit them in front of the television. Uh, you won't want to miss this. We'll be right back after this. back with Occupy Freedom. I'm David Laurie Vanderbeek. Uh, just to give you some basic information, if you want to go to the website to follow the campaign, it's NevadaGovernor2014.com. It's growing uh, rapidly. You can add your email to the newsletter there. If you want to follow us on YouTube, you just put in my first and middle name, David Laurie. You'll get all the videos there. Uh, Twitter is US Family Man. You can also search my name and, and get yourself on our Facebook page. Uh, you can get involved, volunteer. If you have any questions or anything you'd like to see on this show, you go to, or you can email me at david at nevadagovernor2014.com. Now today we're going to be talking with Richard Gage, AIA. Uh, here, we're here in uh, Pahrump, Nevada. He's going to be speaking this Saturday. So if you're in, in southern Nevada or you're anywhere near southern Nevada, you want to come out to Pahrump, Nevada to the Republican Party headquarters 7 p.m. You're going to go to 3370 South Highway 160, Suite 6. So that's this Saturday, the Republican Party headquarters, address 3370 South Highway uh, 160, Suite 6. So be there, bring all the doubters, uh, bring all the Republicans and Democrats that uh, still worship the establishment and anyone else who believes in the official story of 9-11 um, let me just give you a little bit of background about Richard, and then uh, we'll, let, we'll hear from him. He, Richard Gage, this is from the, the website. You look up the website, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. AIA, he's, he's a, a San Francisco Bay architect and a member of the American Institute of Architects. He has been an architect for over 23 years. He's worked on most types of building construction, including numerous fireproofed steel frame buildings, most recently, he worked on the construction documents for a $400 million mixed-use urban project. Altogether, uh, that's about uh, 1,200 tons of steel framing. Uh, Mr. Gage is, uh, began researching the destruction of the World Trade Center high-rises after hearing on the radio the startling conclusions of the reluctant 9-11 researcher, David Ray Griffin, in 2006, which launched his own unyielding quest for truth about 9-11. Since founding Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, Gage has presented 9-11 uh, Blueprint for Truth all over the world, and he's appeared on radio shows and television spots. So the first question I want to ask is, I mean, it's great to have you with us. I, uh, it's an <laughs> honor to have you here. Great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, why are we talking about this? It's been 12 years. Why now? Well, you, you have to remember that 9-11 started two major wars in the Middle East, Afghanistan and Iraq. We've lost over 6,000 soldiers now. Over a million people have been killed in those wars. Mm. And since then, we have the implementation of the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, the National Defense Authorization Act, all of which mm. have taken away precious civil liberties, which we have cherished. Uh, actually, uh, they've taken away liberties that date back to the Magna Carta. I mean, any of us uh, today, you, me, any of our listeners, can be arrested, held indefinitely, not told what we're charged with, not given a right to a trial, not even to have a lawyer present and we can even be tortured. Now, this is all legal. I'll say legal, it's not constitutional. Mm -hmm. uh, but this can happen and is happening. And all of it dates back 
to what happened on 9-11. If there are any questions about what happened on 9-11, then every congressman, every senator, every U.S. citizen needs to stand up and say, hey, let's look at this squarely. Let's not sweep it under the carpet. Yes. These questions, which we're going to be discussing today, have to be answered, and they have to be answered openly, squarely, yes. in front of the American people. Yeah, for me, and I think for Richard, uh, you, you let me know if you disagree with this, but I don't apologize for wanting to know the truth, and you shouldn't either. Why do we live in a country today where you are termed insensitive or there, there's something wrong with you when you ask real questions? What, I mean, isn't that what, can you agree with that, or what do you think of that? Is, is that true of our society today? It used to be. Uh, we, 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 we used to be able to, we were praised for questioning authority. Benjamin mm -hmm. Franklin, uh, one of his major statements was to question authority. It is the duty of every citizen to mm -hmm. question authority. Uh, now, when we raise questions, we get called names, such as conspiracy theorist, uh, tinfoil hat wearer, Etc. Et something was wrong with the media. They used to do investigative journalism. Now they are parroting yeah. pre-written uh, <laughs> statements that yeah. come from God knows where. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they are not doing their job in investigating the questions that have been raised, particularly about 9/11. Yeah. So th that's what it's so. Gr it's great to have you here. Um, you know. I do want to ask, before we go into describing the organization, I'd like to ask you to tell, if you could tell us, we all, we all remember where we were the morning of 9-11 because it was such a, a big event. I kind of want to know uh, where you were on the morning of 9-11 and what your in initial instincts as a, as, a, as a professional architect when you watched the footage of the towers coming down and the media explanation of it. I just kind of want to know. Yeah, this, what your original feelings were. It's an embarrassing um, tale to tell for me because here I was watching on TV the destruction of both Twin Towers that morning. And I have never seen a skyscraper come down. We, indeed, we've never had one collapse as a result of fire and, or jet plane impacts for that matter. So. What, what I'm looking at is an incredible series of explosions, which we're going to be talking about. But what I'm being told by the experts is that this is a gravitational collapse due to structural weakening. Um, eventually, this became the official story. Um, what we're told uh, is that the upper portion of the, these buildings drove the rest of the building down to the ground. We, we're in a state of shock, I particularly in... On, in the morning of 9-11, I'm looking at these towers, and, and, and we're under attack after the second tower got hit by the airplane, and before both of the, either of them came down, uh, we're now realizing, oh my God, this is not an accident, right? So we mm -hmm. are under attack. Well, what does this mean? When's the next one coming? What, what, uh, what are the implications of this? We're in cognitive dissonance. Uh, where one reality, life as normal, is in complete juxtaposition uh, to, with this set of unknowns. So all of a sudden, we're looking for answers, and we're very likely to accept them from whatever source of authority uh, feeds them to us. And indeed, we were fed uh, very quickly. Osama bin Laden, uh, jet plane hijackings, uh, used his missiles into, into uh, buildings. Uh, buildings falling as a result of these impacts and fires. Um, why would we question that? Uh, we trust our government. And so for the next four years, I, I just kind of put it aside. This is a very painful event. No one wants to go back and look at this. We set it aside, mm -hmm. and actually not until March of 2006, when I did hear this mm -hmm. interview from David Ray Griffin, had I ever considered uh, that what I was seeing was not what, uh, what was being told to us. Uh, so he provided this evidence uh, that was not in the NIST report, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, wasn't in the uh, reports by the media, uh, wasn't um, given to us by our government. All of this evidence completely overlooked, actually 
covered up, as it, as it turns out. And uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm having to question myself. I mean, here I was, a Reagan Republican, kind of rooting for Colin Powell as he went to the UN to give this mm -hmm. uh, overwhelming case uh, for weapons of mass destruction, uh, for ties to Osama bin Laden, uh, so that we could go to war and, um, and get those bastards, the Iraqis, who were right. responsible for 9-11, right. right? Wrong. Wrong. Uh, uh, maybe Afghanistan, uh, get Osama bin Laden. Well, everything got turned upside down for me when I discovered that I had been lied to by the media, by the government, uh, by NIST, and uh, this evidence that we're going to be talking to today is overwhelming. When we present it to people, and I've presented this over 300 times now all around the world, we do a show of hands. How many of you are in agreement with the official story? And I explain what that is. It's very simple. Jet plane impacts, fires, structural weakening down to the ground. How many of you are unsure of what brought the towers down? Maybe you've heard a few things. How many of you already agree, perhaps, with the evidence for controlled demolition that we're going to present? After the presentations, Almost always, 85 to 95 and often 100% of the people end up agreeing with us and nobody's unsure quite often. So this evidence speaks for itself. It's overwhelming. Okay. So we are going to, after these uh, advertisements, we're going to come back and we're going to get into some of the, into the organization and the evidence. And uh, this is Occupy Freedom. Come right back with us. We're back. This is Occupy Freedom. I'm David Laurie Vanderbeek here with Richard Gage, AIA, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Uh, you were just kind of telling us about your experience and how you got into this movement. And uh, so why don't you just tell us a, a bit about the organization, its mission, kind of what you hope to accomplish, what you have accomplished. Since March of 2006, uh, we have assembled uh, 1,800 architects and engineers, degreed and or licensed, who are calling now uh, for a new investigation, a real investigation, unimpeachable, with subpoena power, that actually gets to the root of what happened on 9-11. So I represent these architects and engineers, and I'm proud to do that. We're, we're getting uh, into scientific forensic evidence. We don't have conspiracy theories. We don't speculate as to who may have been responsible for the evidence uh, that has been found, which contradicts the official story. Okay. <laughs> well, let's, let, let's talk about the evidence. We, I want you to know from this expert, what is the evidence? Why, why, did you, wh wh why should we question? Why are all, what is it that these architects and engineers are so concerned about when they, they look at the evidence? Well, I like to start with the third skyscraper that collapsed on 9-11 because most architects and engineers know nothing about it. Yeah, so you all know there were three buildings that fell on September 11th, three buildings. And these, you got that? Three buildings, so make sure, it wasn't just two towers, make sure everybody in the family understands there was three buildings, two of them got hit by planes, but one didn't get hit by anything, but it still collapsed into its own footprint. This is true. And um, we don't even use the word collapse, because collapse implies an organic uh, collapse, if you will, uh, okay. with asymmetrical uh, features uh, that uh, buildings, Buildings don't do what uh, the Twin Towers in Building 7 did. Uh, Building 7 is a 47-story skyscraper, about a football field in length away from the Twin Towers. And after the towers came down that morning, this building is standing fine, got hit by a, few, a little bit of debris from the North Tower, uh, had a few small scattered fires in it. Uh, and this is acknowledged by NIST, although they exaggerate the... the uh, the, the nature of these fires, uh, but in the afternoon at 5.20, this building drops like a rock, straight down almost, symmetrically almost, and into its footprint almost, and at free fall acceleration for much of its descent. Now, 
That building dropped as fast as this pen. Three, two, one. How can a building drop that fast when it has 40,000 tons of structural steel in it that's three to five times mm. stronger than it needs to be to hold that building up? The only way that can happen is if all 80 columns on each floor, of at least eight floors, uh, is, are taken out all at once. That can only be done by an explosive force. It can't be done by fire. Fire is an organic process. It moves through a building, burning out an area every 20 minutes or so, because that's all the fuel uh, that there is in that portion of the building. So fire moves on and any collapse, which would happen, say, in wood frame buildings, never in a steel frame or, or concrete skyscraper for that matter. Um, but in a wood frame building, you'd, you'd have slow, uh, halting, uh, asymmetrical collapse. Uh, but this building drops like, like, like a rock, as we'll show on Saturday night. And as you can see on our website, AE911Truth. Dot org. That stands for Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, AE911Truth.org. So we show this to architects, engineers, and others, and they just drop their jaw. You mean our government, our media, mainstream media, told us that that building came down by normal office fires? No way. <laughs> Everybody gets it. We've seen on TV, the old hotels here in Las Vegas, they drop uh, uh, that fast, that symmetrically, um, and uh, they, they, they're completely destroyed. The elements, the structural elements of these buildings are separated from one another because that's what they do. They, they, they can then load it into, it's very easily to load it and ship it away. Hmm. And, and that's what this building does. Almost every structural steel element is separated uh, from one another. And not only that, but what's found in the debris pile by officials, first FEMA, uh, who did an initial study in 2002. It's unbelievable. Uh, they find hot corrosion attack on the steel, molten iron attacking the steel with hot sulfur as well. Now, the one piece of steel that was saved, or two pieces, from built for Building 7 have this characteristic feature on it. And this is very well documented. The rest of it was hauled away and illegally destroyed. This is evidence in a crime scene. Mm -hmm. And this is a crime by any definition. It was declared an act of war so that, that theoretically they didn't have to obey by the rules of crime scene investigation, a saving of the evidence. So they find uh, and document in the Building Performance Assessment Report, uh, FEMA, in their Appendix C, that this steel had corrosion. It, it was actually melted. Now, you can't achieve temperatures to melt steel in normal office fires. They only get to be about 800 to maybe 1600 degrees in the hottest office fires, Fahrenheit. Steel doesn't melt until about twice those temperatures, 28 degrees, 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. What can produce those temperatures? What can produce molten iron? What can produce sulfur? Okay, wait. Elemental sulfur. Okay, so it, it, you're saying an office fire is 800 to 600, 1600. 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, did you get that? That's what office fires are. And and what does it take to burn steel or melt Over steel? Over 2800 degrees temperature. So 2800 degrees Fahrenheit would have been necessary to, to melt the steel in Building 7 that was never hit by anything other than some, some debris. Yeah, there wasn't even jet fuel in that building. And even jet fuel can't get, uh, that, according to the manufacturer, only burns in open air about 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Some say more than that, but uh, never above the, the temperature at which hydrocarbons, which is what it is, uh, burn. So we have an unexplained uh, uh, phenomena here that... <clears throat> how were those temperatures achieved? I mean, that's the question, right? I mean, yeah. how... So, um, here's a likely suspect. Thermite is an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. Very effective. And there are patented devices that use thermite to do just that, cut through structural steel in milliseconds. So, in a deceptive controlled demolition, it is very possible 
that thermite could have been used in such devices at the structural connections in this building, which would have produced exactly what the officials found from the FEMA report, as documented in Appendix C, uh, hot molten iron, the byproduct of thermite. Uh, uh, sulfur, elemental sulfur, the byproduct of thermate, uh, of an enhanced form of thermite where sulfur is added. There's no other explanation for the sulfur that makes any sense. Um, so, and, and even the author of the FEMA report, Jonathan Barnett, says some of the ends of these beams were partly evaporated. That requires temperatures exceeding 4,000 degrees. Well, that's what thermite creates, 4,500 degree temperatures of molten iron as its byproduct. And structural engineers and uh, cleanup workers and first responders, many of them, dozens of them, report pools of molten iron. They're aghast. They said flowing like lava uh, down, the structure, down the channel rails. Uh, in fact, the World Trade Center structural engineer himself, Leslie Robertson, describes a river of molten steel that he saw on site. And this, occur this is occurring you know, up to a month or more after the collapse or Hold destruction on. of these buildings. You're saying that there was molten steel a month after? Well, it turns out to be molten iron, uh, but whether it's molten steel or molten iron, uh, both require those temperatures. And yes, the persistence of this level of heat uh, was uh, astonishing to many of the first, resp first responders. How, how would, what would, what would cause something to maintain that level of heat over that amount of time? I mean, jet fuel, you're saying, couldn't even get there to begin with. Right. So it, it had to be something other like thermite or sulfur or thermate or... Something that creates molten iron, something that creates the sulfur that was documented by officials, uh, something that can evaporate the ends of these beams, the, the two that they saved again. Uh, so we have some real questions that have to be answered in a real investigation. That's why okay. we have 1,800 architects and engineers calling for all right, I appreciate that. We're going to come right back after this with more information. Okay, we're back with Occupy Freedom. I'm David Laurie Vanderbeek. I'm here with Richard Gage, AIA, the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And we've been talking about how the official story doesn't fit uh, with the physical evidence. And there's a lot more evidence that suggests that this were more of a controlled demolition when the, the buildings came down, specifically in the case of World Trade Center uh, Tower 7. And so what that brings the question to mind is, okay, so if it was more of a controlled demolition, there were explosives in the buildings, and that's what the evidence suggests, do we have any evidence that somebody, they would have had to have foreknowledge, they would have had to put the, those explosives there. Was there? Is there any evidence of that? Well, interestingly enough, the, the firefighters were pulled out of the building uh, in the afternoon, and they're, and, they're, and they're told there was structural damage in this building, and indeed some, some beams and debris hit the building early on from the North Tower. Um, so there's, there's kind of standing around scratching their heads, well, what do we do about this? Um, and, and then at 5 o'clock, well, let, let's take a step back. Uh, later that afternoon, mysterious construction workers are walking away from the building, and this is caught on CNN camera. Uh, they hear an explosion. They look back over their shoulder. They look into the camera and they say, you hear that? Keep your eye on that building. That building's coming down. Flame and debris coming down. The building's going to blow up. They say all this on CNN camera. Of course, we didn't see this on CNN news. But they, they, th this is extraordinary. They knew the building's going to blow up. Here's a few small fires in the building. And they're saying it's going to blow up. This is extraordinary. Well, at 5 o'clock, the... So, is there footage of those that people can watch? Yes. Footage? This is in our presentation. We'll be showing that footage tonight. 
I mean, Saturday night. So, uh, okay, so uh, you're going to talk about where all of our viewers can see that information, even if they can't be at the presentation. Oh, yeah. You'll go to the website. Okay. This, you can watch. Uh, Construction workers walking away from the building, yeah. saying, keep your eye on that building. Yep. It's coming down, yep. flame and debris, <laughs> yep. before it happened. Yeah, go to ae911truth.org. Find our, our Blueprint for Truth uh, video in the evidence section. You can watch this yourself. It is extraordinary. You can also see right on the cover of the front page of our website, Building 7 coming down at free fall acceleration, straight down, etc. Mm. So the BBC, at 5 o'clock, about 20 minutes before the building actually collapsed, they announced the collapse of this building. A 47 story, I and mean, it's right behind Jane Stanley, the reporter, standing there, and she's announced the collapse of the building 20 minutes before it actually happened. I've seen that. Then they apologized later for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. That was C CNN or what, what news? BBC. BBC, so. CNN. Actually. BBC, so they're across the ocean, and they know our building's fallen before it's fallen. <laughs> yeah, this is really good reporting. <laughs> and they, uh, you know, they, they say, oh, I'm really sorry. The events are so confusing, but does that make them psychic? I mean, exactly. What, some kind of something's going on here. We need to get to the bottom. Yeah, are they prophets or are they reporters? Because somehow they're able to prophesy of the news before it's actually occurred. I well, thought... CNN announced the destruction of a building at uh, 1045 that morning. They report this at 1107. Uh, and, and, you know, had that building come down at 1045, we might not even have the great videos of it coming down that uh, ultimately surfaced because the Twin Towers created massive smoke clouds that would have obscured that, um, that, building, that building's destruction. So some people hypothesize that it was supposed to come down at that time, and that's what these construction workers were doing coming back um, and, and saying the oh, building's wow. going to blow up. Uh, they're fixing perhaps a dud. That's speculation. Uh, we don't put too much weight on that. We just look at the forensic evidence. In the in the demolition of buildings, though, is that is it, is it not uncommon for them to have to make adjustments before bringing down a huge building like that for maybe it not to uh, go off exactly as planned? I imagine there's a lot of preparation that goes into that. I wouldn't want to be the guy that has to go back there and fix it. <laughs> I've seen some duds uh, of, of controlled demolitions. You have. The Twin Towers, yeah, were, were a very different story. Um, yeah, let's get they, into that. Let's get into the Twin Towers. It's pretty extraordinary because, you know, what we were told is that this upper portion above the point of jet plane impact, say in the North Tower, 12 stories, drives the rest of the building down to the ground. And we kind of go, oh, okay because we don't want to question authority. We don't want to even want to go back to that painful series of events. Uh, almost 3,000 people died yeah. in the Twin Towers, right. after all. But when you look at it objectively, you see that there's no 12-story section driving the rest of the building down. It's been destroyed in the first four seconds. We show this clearly in our <clears throat> video uh, DVD also and in the presentation <clears throat> tomorrow night. Um, it is gone. It's like a minute... It's like a miniature controlled demolition in and of itself. Uh, it's, it's telescoping down just like Building 7. Then after that, uh, uh, well, first of all, at that time, what, we have 100, 118 first responders on record talking about the, the, uh, the, the explosions that are occurring uh, before the building starts down. Uh, and those explosions uh, get to be very visible after yeah. this first four seconds, and, and they're hurling these huge structural steel sections four tons uh, laterally at 60 miles an hour. Physicists have clocked this laterally, landing up to 600 feet away. This is really extraordinary and indicative of a, of a, of a very explosive force. You remember, gravity works downward. We learned this in right. grade school and before. Uh, what we're seeing here is an incredible mushrooming of this building with massive pyroclastic clouds that are indicative because of their cauliflower shapes of explosive uh, explosives going off. This is not the result of a, of, of, a, of a collapsing building. Massive heat producing these cauliflower shaped clouds. And then th these are trailing these structural steel elements uh, laterally, pulverized building materials. 
In fact, 90,000 tons of concrete is being pulverized in mid-air to create uh, the solids in these clouds. It, it, this concrete is not pulverized down at the base of the buildings. Uh, it's pulverized in mid-air. And then symmetrically, this destruction occurs all the way down to the ground. Almost every structural steel element is blown apart or cut or, uh, from every other element. Uh, this is amazing. We would expect to see 110 floors, or maybe 50 of them or 10, but we don't see one semi-intact uh, floor uh, stacked up like pancakes at the bottom of what's supposed to be a gravitational collapse. Uh, what do we see? A two-story pile of core columns, perimeter columns, in the rubble piles of each of each of these two towers. This is amazing. You're saying that the, the evidence there's evidence on, on on the footage of there being explosions, not at the top but on the sides, or <laughs> well, there are explosions below this mushrooming, laterally distributing structural steel sections hurling laterally. Explosions below which uh, are called squibs in the demolition industry. They're isolated explosive ejections. They're occurring at 200 feet per second, many of them. These are not uh, the result of air pressure produced by this collapse. Uh, these are highly focalized, pinpoint accurate, violent ejections occurring you know, at singular uh, window spaces. If there was a air pressure, it would blow out all the windows on these floors. They're shooting beams out. Uh, up above that uh, phenomena, there are uh, structural steel elements, beams, girders, uh, columns, uh, in addition to aluminum okay. uh, panels being ejected laterally. Uh, I want to know, and I want people to know, what would a, a building of that size and that architecture normally do if a plane hit it? Historically, what is it? I mean, well, is that, could we talk about sure. that? Sure, even NIST, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked with explaining this, uh, these three uh, collapses, uh, says that uh, the plane impacts uh, were not solely responsible. The building structure did its job to resist those plane impacts. They fault mostly the fires and the heat, which they say caused... Uh, uh, sagging of the floor trusses, which pulled in the perimeter columns, which then buckled and allowed this upper portion to drive the rest of the building down to the ground. But that's not what we see once again. What we see is a series of explosions, like the first responders described, wrapped like a belt all the way around uh, the building. And then we see those <coughs> explosions traveling at almost free fall acceleration straight down the buildings. And this is occurring almost at free fall acceleration. Uh, you, almost as fast as the free-falling debris. All right, uh, we're going to come back with more evidence. I want to know more, and I hope you want to know more about why these buildings could come down like that. We'll be right back after this. Hey, this is Occupy Freedom. I'm David Laurie Vanderbeek, next governor of Nevada. I'm here with Richard Gage, AIA founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Just one question I got to ask. If, if I was a businessman in New York and I owned one of the neighboring buildings and somebody was going to come in and build these towers originally, I mean, didn't the engineers, when they built, uh, didn't they contemplate that a plane could hit a building ahead of time? Did they make any preparations for that? Wasn't this a scenario that architects have dealt with before and prepared for? I mean... Well, certainly the uh, structural engineer of the, of the Trade Center Towers designed these buildings to be hit. Uh, well, designed them to resist the, the impact of a, a 707 traveling 600 miles an hour. Jonathan Skilling uh, tells us this. And he said the problem would be that the fuel would dump into the building, but that the building would still be there. So they were certainly designed to resist and resist, would, would he have thought, oh yeah, there's going to be a fire afterwards? I mean, yeah. wouldn't he have thought ahead of time, I'm, I'm going to build a building that can withstand a plane crash and the fire afterwards? And indeed, uh, there was fireproofing put into these buildings uh, to resist uh, such fires. But there were explosions in the basements that were documented uh, by mm -hmm. many people. 
And, uh, right, right. Talk about the explosions there, because I, I've heard about there being explosions in the bot uh, bottoms and people coming out all burned and, and, and hurt, yeah. well, injured. This is real curious, and in the lobbies of these buildings as well. Um, before the, the, the towers uh, came down, uh, it, it could be, this is speculation again, and in the basements we have the <coughs> fire sprinkler mains. It could be that those were taken out in order to keep uh, the fires from putting, keep the sprinklers from putting out the fires. So uh, that that's again is, is is speculation, and we don't rest our hat on these. But okay. one thing we do rest our hat on is the evidence yeah. for the incendiaries. Once again, incendiaries uh, rather than explosives. There is evidence in the World Trade Center dust, all of it, uh, and extraordinary evidence. In fact, evidence uh, found and documented by the U.S. Geological Survey. So you're talking about. Evidence of incendiaries in the rubble of the buildings. Yeah, and all the World Trade Center dust from river to river across lower Manhattan. This dust is composed of small iron microspheres. Now, uh, they're, they're about the diameter of a human hair average. Uh, they're everywhere. In fact, they say it's not even World Trade Center dust unless it has all these microspheres, which amount to billions, in them. Now, they're iron, first of all. They're not steel. So this is not melted steel. This is like okay. 10 tons of molten iron. Where did that come from? Once again, molten iron is a byproduct of thermite, this incendiary. And they're round, spherical. They, that can only be formed for, in, in air. So here we're, we're talking about uh, atomized liquid molten iron that has been uh, forms itself by surface tension into droplets, which fall air. signature elements of, of thermite in them. This is semi-documented by the USGS, by R.J. Hmm. Lee, an environmental consultant, but not explained. They have no explanation for 10 tons of molten iron spheres. They have no explanation either for the small red-gray chips, which were found by an independent team of scientists led by Niels Harrett in Copenhagen, a Ph.D. chemist. This is amazing. These chips are about 16th of an inch large. They're found in all four samples, independently collected uh, by uh, individuals and, and provided to this team. Uh, they are red on one side, gray on the other. The red side, in turn, is composed of extremely small particles of what? Iron oxide and aluminum powder, the ingredients of thermite in the perfect proportion to make up thermite. They are... Uh, so small, they're a thousand times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. These are nanoparticles of an incendiary, a very sophisticated form of this incendiary made only in the most advanced defense contracting laboratories. There's about 10 tons of this material uh, as extrapolated throughout all the World Trade Center dust. Defense contracting laboratories in the Middle East? Or Afghanistan? Well, we need to find out where they are. I don't think so. I, I think this is made uh, only in the U.S. It was documented by Lawrence Livermore Lab, Los Alamos Lab. Prior we build to it. I mean, we make this. We, we, we make this ourselves. Well, somebody makes it, uh, some defense contractor. In fact, um, as a matter of fact, uh, NIST brought in defense contractors who were in, uh, involved in the development of nanothermite to aid the investigation of the destruction of these towers, yeah. including the analysis of this dust. So they were certainly capable of finding the nanoparticles of uh, this uh, composite incendiary. Okay. So it's an incendiary that, that our own defense department can create. Contractors. Con uh, it can contract contractors. contractors to use for our military. It, it, it could have been, it, I mean, that's one it, it's a certain, origin or a source of it. It's a, it's a required uh, source of investigation uh, uh, for, uh, that, that we're calling for. Sure, like sure, that. sure. I mean, yeah, so can you honestly ask the question of yourself, is, is it, uh, if, if, you know, Osama bin Laden was responsible for these attacks, he would have had to have acquired this kind of thing, or, because, uh, you know, or how did this whole thing occur? I mean, it just leads to so many questions about, how it would have been possible for uh, men in turbans with box cutters to accomplish 
what we witnessed on, I mean, that would lead me to have those questions, per, me personally. Yeah, and, and me as well, and the 1,800 architects and engineers that I represent. So tell us, you know, in, in, our, in our final minutes here, tell us what all this means. I want to know what all this means. I want to know what people do with this knowledge. How do they get involved? What do we do? Well, everybody can do something. The, the, the first step is to get informed. And of course, Saturday night, we're going to be spending a couple of hours presenting this information graphically in a multimedia presentation. Uh, we have a DVD that's uh, also available on the website. You, sh you can show that oh, yeah. uh, for people. Um, this is 9-11 uh, Explosive Evidence, Experts Speak Out. We have more than 43 architects and engineers, high-rise architects, structural engineers, metallurgists, physicists, controlled demolitions experts, fire protection engineers on record providing the testimony of uh, the evidence here. And we also have eight psychologists, by the way, who talk about why this material is so difficult to even begin to look at. Because mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. the implications of 9-11 being a controlled, de controlled demolition mm -hmm. raise all kinds of important issues. As you suggested, the the nanothermite uh, is not made uh, in a cave in Afghanistan. It's a very sophisticated yeah. scientific process. Right. And uh, so we've got to have an investigation whose, whose investigators are above the level of reproach. Uh, we've got to have an impartial, unimpeachable investigation that uses subpoena power that offers immunity to witnesses to bring them forth. Uh, somebody we can trust. And by the way, I don't think that includes the 9-11 Commission, okay. who didn't even mention the destruction of the third, well, the third worst structural failure in modern history, Building 7. You, okay, so you're talking about the 9-11 Commission created by the government to investigate this. Right. I mean, we, we don't have any of this evidence which was available They to didn't them. talk about... Not one explosion of the hundreds of witnesses who... And, and other evidence for explosions was brought into the 9-11 Commission report, the NIST report, the FEMA report. It's been ex ex exhumed, expelled, uh, taken away from the, in, the, uh, these reports. It's gone. The, in fact, FEMA's documenting of the corroded steel uh, and melted steel, looks like Swiss cheese, that was removed from the uh, final report of the of, of NIST's also, even though it was in the earlier FEMA report. Uh, so, so they're going to be able to see this. They p can get the DVD. They can come to the meeting. And you're saying that people, the first thing they need to do is kind of get together, study the information. Kind of where do where do they go from there? Then once they've got this information, uh, what do you recommend? What kind of experience have you had? I mean, I'm, I'm interested to know. Yeah, there's a lot of questions here. Um, the, the 1,800 architects and engineers that I represent want a real investigation. If we get one, it will, uh, if it's impartial, show the evidence uh, for the uh, uh, incendiaries and, 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 the, and the structure, the destruction of these buildings. Uh, it, it's very unlikely that Al-Qaeda had access to these buildings. Uh, we're probably looking at some sort of an inside operation. Mm -hmm. We don't know how high it goes, how wide it goes. Uh, these are extremely important questions for all Americans. I don't know how this will unfold, but I do know that every American has the duty uh, to make sure uh, that they are informed, uh, that they are uh, relentless in the pursuit of getting an investigation, which can be as simple in terms of it of what can be done as sending the link to our website, ae911truth.org, to every architect and engineer mm -hmm. that they can find, every media representative, every elected representative. That can be done sitting at home on our computers. Yeah. That's an easy task. Say, hey, look at this. What do you think? These look like credible individuals. I mean, they're all verified, these architects and engineers. Their degrees. Their Can licenses. I see that? See, see, because I, I imagine you could take this, you could give it to uh, your state representatives, you could give it to your county representatives, you could you could get it on television in your local area. 
Um, you could share it with city council members. You could share it with federal uh, employees, government employees. You can get your families together. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, you know, that changed my life was when I had a, uh, I have a brother who uh, works for the Department of Homeland Security, and he got the whole family together and made us watch documentaries about these kinds of things. Wow. And this was one of the topics was, um, uh, what we, well, false flag terrorism. And, and, and the truth is, is that the reality is, is that governments have a history of staging terrorist events and blaming them on other countries for uh, whatever motivations or whatever, uh, you know, was their agenda at that time. And, you know, I, I just, for me, as the next governor of Nevada, the truth is the most important thing. I, I believe, I don't believe we need to hide the truth from the public. I think as Americans, the more that we know the truth, we can make real decisions about our lives. And I'll absolutely support a real investigation in Nevada for 9-11 truth because I want my residents to know what's going on, even if the rest of the country wants to turn a blind eye. That's right. And even Nevada has jurisdiction uh, over the events of 9-11 because they're so complex. They, they, they naturally uh, occur in, in, in every state, uh, par parts of that crime. And it is a crime we're looking at. And it is a crime uh, of historical proportions, obviously. Okay. And so once we become aware, becoming aware of 9-11 being other than what we were told uh, is the most important part. That alone can stop the next 9-11. We're going to be right back after this. More from Richard Gage, founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. This has been Occupy Freedom I'm here with Richard Gage, the founder, AIA, the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. You were going to say something, uh, final words for our audience. Yeah, I, I want everybody to look for the documentary uh, to be on your local PBS station because uh, it's been played, aired uh, in PBS Colorado and it is slated to be aired in September on 20 PBS stations across the country because it became the number one most watched and most viewed video last September on PBS.org and we're very proud of that. So the word is getting out. Okay, this is so awesome. It's been, it's been a great honor to have you here. We really appreciate his work. I hope that you all appreciate his work. Um, I was affected by 9-11. Every one of us was affected by 9-11, these 9-11 terrorist attacks. I've already cried about it. I've already been traumatized. I worked through the evidence, so I, I, we don't need to cry anymore. We just need to accept the truth, face the cancer that's in our country that, of, the, of the propaganda, and then we can actually get back to being real Americans because we got all this, D, this TSA, DHS, FBI, CIA, whatever it is in the, in the government. We need to uncover the corruption. We need the people to have the truth. I want the truth. This is Occupy Freedom. I'm David Laurie Vanderbeek, the next governor of Nevada.